for almost 10,000 years, almost as long as the people of the Middle East. <laughs> it's amazing to think that these people, Yali's people, were some of the earliest farmers in the world. But if they were farmers, why weren't they propelled down the same path towards civilization as the people of the Middle East or China or Central America? Why didn't they end up producing their own cargo? New Guinea farmers themselves were surely no less talented than farmers anywhere else in the world. So what was the difference? Highland agriculture was based on crops like these taro roots, which are very different from cereal crops. Taro is much more work. You've got to plant it one by one, unlike wheat where you throw your hand and spread the seed. And these New Guinea crops, can't be stored for years the way wheat can. They rot quickly, they have to be eaten in a short time. They're also low in protein compared to wheat, so these farmers of the New Guinea Highlands suffered from protein deficiency. There's not much protein to be gotten from New Guinea's other crops either. People here farm local varieties of bananas. But although bananas are rich in sugar and starch, like taro, they're low in protein. In fact, people in the highlands have so little protein that sometimes they eat giant spiders to supplement their diet. I'd reached a moment of realization Farming was clearly crucial to the story of human inequality. But just as important was the type of farming. People around the world who had access to the most productive crops became the most productive farmers. Ultimately, it came down to geographic luck. It's an audacious idea that the inequalities of the world were born from the crops we eat. According to Jared Diamond, Americans have had an advantage over New Guineans because for centuries they've grown crops that are more nutritious and productive. Crops like wheat, which provides about a fifth of all the calories they eat. The wealth of modern America could never have been sustained by taro and bananas. But Diamond's idea seems almost too simple. Could plants alone really have the power to shape the course of human history? Or was there something else at play? Another reason for the division of the world into haves and have-nots. By 9,000 years ago, the first settlements in the Middle East were giving way to much larger villages. People were only able to live on this scale by becoming more productive farmers. They were surrounded by fields of domesticated wheat and barley. But by now, they also had another steady source of food. What we see happening about 9,000 years ago is a remarkable transformation in the way that humans are interacting with animals. We begin to see a process of animal domestication, by which we mean humans were controlling where they were moving, they were controlling their feeding, and they were controlling their breeding. Instead of having to go out to hunt, you have a dependable meat supply on the hoof uh, year-round around your site, rather than being subject to seasonal variations in wild game. As well as meat, 
animals could be used for their milk, providing an ongoing source of protein. Their hair and skins could be used to make clothes for extra warmth. Over time, domestic animals became an integral part of the new agricultural way of life. We know that uh, the communities which first started to have domestic animals already had cereal crops, so they were cultivators. And the combination of these particular animals and the plants becomes an extremely attractive package in that they're complementary. After the harvest period, animals could be turned out on the stubble and they can actually eat the remains of the cereal crop harvest. In their turn, animal dung can be used to provide a sort of a fertilizer for the cereal crops as well, for crops. So the whole, the whole package, you know, is seen to be mutually beneficial, both for the animals and the plants, and of course, for the humans. Goats and sheep were the first animals to be domesticated in the ancient world and were eventually followed by the other big farm animals of today. All of them were used at first for their meat, but they all proved useful in other ways, especially with the invention of the plow. Before the Industrial Revolution, beasts of burden were the most powerful machines on the planet. A horse or an ox harnessed to a plow could transform the productivity of the land, allowing farmers to grow more food and feed more people. In New Guinea and many other parts of the world, people never used plows because they never had the animals to pull them. The only big domestic animal in New Guinea was the pig, and it wasn't even native. It came in from Asia a few thousand years ago. While Europe and Asia had not only pigs, but also cows, sheep, goats, horses, buffalo, camels, and so on. Now, pigs do give you meat, but pigs don't give you the other products that you get from those European nation animals. Pigs don't give you milk or wool or leather or hides, and most important of all, pigs can't be used for muscle power. Pigs don't pull plows or pull carts. The only muscle power in New Guinea was human muscle power. Even today, there are no beasts of burden in New Guinea, and almost all of the farm work is still done by hand. But if farm animals were so useful, why didn't New Guineans domesticate any of their own? I decided to add up all the animals in the world that have ever been domesticated. And I was amazed by what I found. <laughs> 